spoilers? Oh, lots and lots of spoilers. The curtain comes crashing down. The colors bleed into the night, and we are left, simple actors bereft of story, adulation, and huge stacks of bumpy bucks. But for a bumpy hut catalog, we would simply strut our time back and forth across the stage, mumbling over and over, this is not my beautiful house, this is not my beautiful wife. None of this has anything to do with Max Mike Movies, the podcast that brings you Max, Mike, and movies every week without fail. Mostly. Uh, or yonder is that critic defart masterpiece Max Levine, and I, I be the pusher of paint, Kitchmeister Mike Luce. Say hi to the nice people. Howdy. <laughs> That's it. Okay. We are finally bringing our 18th series to a close. For the past nine weeks, we've been looking at semi-real people, the biopic story, or stories, and this week's entry is certainly one of those. Pollock mm. tells us not about the tasty fish, batter fried and crisp, but about the turbulent delicious. life of one... Mm, delicious batter fried... <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Tells us not about the tasty fish, but about the turbulent life of one of America's best-known painters. Before we get to that, we're going to get to this. You! We put out a poll question, and now we are going to hear what you had to say, although in my voice. <laughs> Last week we asked, is there a book that has not yet been adapted into a movie, but you wish had or would be? We got a lot of answers, some even from non-listeners, which is cool, too. Let's start with the man up north, Vince. Quote, I keep hearing how someone or another wants to make Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, ah, 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 into a film, but, <laughs> sorry, that's a paper, but I'm yeah. not sold it would work. My secret wish is that someone would take the super obscure Quentin Crisp fictional novel, I love his serial, the super obscure <laughs> Quentin Crisp fictional novel, I Tog, like I like Quentin Quake better. <laughs> Quisp. Quake. Quisp. <laughs> Quake. <laughs> anyway. uh, he wishes they would take Quentin Crisp's fictional novel, Chog, and do something with it, but it's really out there as it involves a dog that has inherited the title of Duke and fathers a child with the maid. Well, not a child, not what? a dog, what? a Chog. End quote. Chog indeed. Okay, that sounds weird. Yeah. Uh, next is someone masquerading as my sister. It's, in fact, my sister, Val. She says, in response to your poll question, my assistant, Stephen, instantly said, ride a pale horse by Piers Anthony, just so you know, end quote. That huh. will not be the last vote for Anthony's work. Not least from Piers himself. We can just call 1-800-HIGH-PIERS. <laughs> <laughs> that was a thing. Okay, yeah. next we hear from Cheese Boy himself, Ned. Quote, I think we're finally getting to the point in the development of special effects where a movie version of Neuromancer wouldn't be embarrassing to watch. Obviously, the visuals aren't actually the hard part. That would be the casting, the writing, and, you know, everything else. But in order to sell the movie, <laughs> the online bits need to be reasonable. Otherwise, people won't be able to understand Case's obsession with The Matrix, except by categorizing him as a massive nerd. Whew, deep breath there. Okay. On the harder side of things, Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars trilogy is long overdue for a TV series, in my opinion. It jumps the rails a bit in the last book, but until then, the politicking and the intrigue is super compelling. Sure, you need a mega budget to make it work, what with the cast of literally about 60 people, but if games, Game of Thrones can do it, so can this one, end quote. Nice suggestion, Ned. That's a point. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I actually don't know that series. I don't either. But... Uh... Neuromancer, I'm actually really surprised no one's done that. I, it also stuns me that the only William Gibson project that ever was, I, I think, that was no, ever no, wait, made a movie. That, no, that's not him. Huh? No, it was Johnny, uh, Man Johnny Mnemonic. Oh, it was that. Well, I keep thinking that's Philip K. Dick. <laughs> ah, ah, pa, love me. Yeah, I know it's not that. <laughs> but it could be. I know oh. dolphin food. No, you don't. All right. <laughs> Uh, over on Facebook, we heard from Dave, who offers, quote, If I had the budget, I would make a movie out of the old forest chapter of Fellowship of the Ring. I could also do oh, an wow. awesome movie based on the Imjin War. I don't think he meant they, he could, but somebody could. The Bear and the Nightingale could be nice. Also, the Oh, that could work. You know that book? I do. It, it's uh, basically based on Russian folk tales. Oh. It's, it's pretty interesting, and I think... It, 
there's a real Game of Thrones feel about it. I think that would really work. Hmm, cool. He also suggests uh, the Sea of Poppies trilogy by Amitav Ghosh. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Could be awesome if done right, or even Gla the Glass Palace series by the same author. Mostly, though, Dave says books are better than the movies made from them. Well, there you go. <laughs> I think Dave's well, really that, is, that solves that. Yeah, so Dave's saying, no, don't do it. This is your first grade teacher, Glenn. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, next, our old friend. Well, he's not old. In fact, he's younger than us, but, well, anyway. Chuck gave us a few suggestions. His suggestions include Wild Cards, A Spell for Chameleon, Ringworld, The Mistborn Trilogy, The Baroque Cycle, and he says, let's break Hollywood, shall we? I agree, let's. Uh, so that's two votes for high peers. Here's Anthony. And uh, to be fair, there's what, 412 books in the uh, well, series of Xanth? I, I think they've actually invented a new series of mathematics to count how many Xanth books there are. Uh, let's put it this way. There's so many books that Piers had a commercial and a 1-800 number. That's how many books yeah. there are. Um, but quite yeah, honestly. I'm all, that's another one I'm surprised nobody's, actually, nobody's tried. Yeah. Especially now you could make it look, you know, decent. But Yeah. Mm. Uh, Wild Cards, I think somebody is making a yeah. TV show about. They are on like on, on uh, one of the the big the pay stations. I don't know HBO or some such. They are apparently doing a, a Wild Card series, which is a good way to do it. A movie you'd have to be too rushed, but a series that could work. Well, especially because it's not novels; it's all short stories, all cobbled yeah. together by uh, George R. There are a R. couple R. of somebody. novels. <laughs> yeah, um, Jamie. Uh, a non-listener, but hey, that's okay. A uh, friend of mine, Jamie, posted, "quote I read them mostly as adolescent. I read them mostly as an adolescent young adult, and don't have quite the same obsession with them now. But the Arrows of the Queen series by Mercedes Lackey and related series are great for the screen, but have never been done." End quote. Uh, I bet as we found, there's a lot of series like that just ripe for the plucking, except for probably very smart smart authors who are like, "Ah, uh, yeah, thanks, no." <laughs> because <laughs> yeah Val sneaks in again with some of her own thoughts quote either the first Jasper Ford novel I read The Iron Affair or the one I'm reading now Shades of Grey would make great movies if the right studio did it it would have to be an indie studio lots of CG and an all-star cast would ruin them could even be animated providing Ghibli or Laika did them end quote much coolness thanks Val um, I know Damn. of Jasper Ford have not read Jasper Ford I read a couple of them. The Air Affair is kind of is, is a lot of fun, and uh, I think that could work. Cool. Matt says he would like a new adaptation of the Chronicles of Prydain. One could argue that the one Disney did wasn't so much an adaptation as something oh. totally made up. <laughs> oh, that was the Black Cauldron. Yes, it was. Oh, okay. So that yeah, I've heard that. I've heard the books are actually a lot better and should be uh, given better treatment. And lastly, Keith says, quote, they should make a movie out of heart-shaped box by Joe Hill. Whew, that's a lot of answers. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thanks, everybody. You all earned yeah, double Bumpy Bucks it. and the latest issue of the Bumpy Hut catalog, which exists almost someday. All of this leads to another <laughs> poll question, which you can answer in ways that will astound you and which we will go over at the end of the show. This week's poll question is, is there a movie that you think loses impact by being seen on the small screen? Or is there a movie you're really glad you saw in the theater or wish you had seen there? Let us know and you'll earn a mention on the show. And Bumpy Bucks, the cryptocurrency that's worth twice its weight in hair and is just as viable as NFTs. <laughs> but... <clears throat> I, I would like to say the book that I have never seen adapted to screen, which I really think would work, is uh, Strunk and White's Elements of Style. I think that would be a, a real family uh, fun fest. Uh, I did forget to ask you, but now I know mm -hmm. why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was hoping for Robert's Rules. I think that would make a great TV series. Robert's Rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's exciting. Now, is there a book that you're like, I'd really love this to be? Into it. Not really. I usually don't think of, when I read a book, it's like, oh, wow, I'd love to see this on the screen. It's, I don't know. I tend to see them as separate entities. Yeah. Some, uh, when I hear that like a book I really like is about to be made into a movie, my response is usually, eh. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I, I think you're I, quoting I like grandpa. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, I, I can't, I can't really think of any that uh, I've, I've read that have not, that someone has at least not attempted to make into a movie. Uh, there's a bunch I would like to see. Uh, quite honestly, 
I, you know, it would need to be trippy and weird, but I would love to see the Elric books made into a series or mm. a movie. But again, oh, that'd be cheerful. Well, yeah, that too. But it's like, dude, you have to be like tripping to watch. It has to be like that. You can't like mm. try to make it. I don't know, make sense. <laughs> There's also a science fiction book a bunch of us have read. I've read it, I don't know, six, seven times. And I think it would make a great TV series or some limited sort of series. It's a book by Mike Resnick called Santiago. Um, oh, I, yeah. I that adore Santiago. Um, even the follow-up wasn't bad. But Santiago, and heck, I'm surprised. I think somebody was trying to do this at some point and they didn't. But the at least just the first series, none of the, the rest of them, the first series of the Chronicles of Amber... I think would work very well. Mm. I thought someone did try that. I thought they it were was going a mini to, series or something, happened. and it, it. I thought someone made it, and just nobody watched it. That might have happened. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, a poll question. We'll go over it again at the end of the show, but for yep. now, it's Pollock. The show trivia budget yes. six million dollars. Go ahead and guess, Max. You'll probably be close. Uh, Take what? eight million dollars. You're close. It was ten. So uh, yeah, not a huge this, hit. this was well. This didn't really get a lot of wide release. I saw this movie in a film club. Mm. So sadly, um, any one of his paintings was worth more than they made off this movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only re- reason this movie was made was because Ed Harris's father saw a book about Pollock, thought his son looked like the artist, and gave it to him for his birthday. <laughs> Harris became interested and eventually decided to make this movie. Yep. So, hey, you look kind of like Pollock. What do you think? Sure, I'll make a major motion picture. <laughs> Harris directed People have this done movie. done it for weirder reasons. Yeah, and some far worse than that. So, um, Harris directed this movie not because he wanted to direct, but because he'd been with the project for so long, he didn't want anybody else to. Oh. Well, as it turned out, a lot of other people involved were like, yeah, he was the only one who knew the uh, material, who knew all the research stuff as well as he did. So it seemed oh. stupid to get somebody else to come in who ha- would have to get up to speed. So Ed Harris, a method actor, not only collapsed on set from pushing himself too hard, halted filming for six weeks so he could gain 30 pounds and grow a scruffy beard for the final scenes of Pollock's life. Yeah. Cause, wow. Yep. That is not a fat suit. Uh, Ed Harris's father plays the veterinarian later in the movie. Yeah. Mm, mm, neat. Ed Harris was such a method actor that when he falls off his bicycle and seems to cut his hand, he really cut his hand. Okay, it wasn't planned, but it did actually happen. So There's not a lot of trivia this week. Um, <laughs> original choices for Pollock include Jack Nicholson and Robert De Niro. Sure, but don't <laughs> most male roles... <laughs> I mean, that's pretty yeah, much true. Yeah. Like even Pac-Man, I'm sure it's like, could we get De Niro? Yeah, you know. No, no, it's actually it's a uh, federal law that any major dramatic male role has to be offered to Robert De Niro before anyone else. Oh. It it's the law. You can be in quite serious trouble if you don't. It's a law. Yep. <laughs> that's right. He was offered Charlton Heston's part. He had to be. See? Utterly <laughs> unrecognizable. Blew- I'm sorry. Go ahead. What? You know. Hey. Well, you blew it up. You blew it up. Damn you all to hell. Damn you all to hell. Yeah, De Niro could have pulled it off. I thought I heard a little Brando sneaking in there. (laughs) Just a little. Anyway, (laughs) utterly unrecognizable Bud Court, last seen in episode 124's Harold and Maude, (laughs) plays Howard Putzel in this movie. No idea. (laughs) Yeah, uh, apparently it's like, hey, there's Bud Court. Let's give him a part. Yeah. Uh, the exteriors of Pollock's real Long Island home and studio were used. All the interior shots were done on sound stages located nearby. The film was nom- nominated. Nom- 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 the film was nominated for two Academy Awards for actors Ed Harris and Marcia Gay Harden. Harden won for Best Supporting Actress. Ed Harris was in a movie called Night Riders. Do you remember Night Riders? Uh, it was the no? King Arthur tale told on motorcycles and it had Brother Blue in it. Oh, Lord. <laughs> who, who was he? Uh, a knight. But oh, yeah, okay. it was one of his N- earliest Knight number movies. four? Okay. Yeah. Knight oh, Riders, look it up. Lord. Wow. And lastly, Marsha Gay Harden was so mean she once shot a man just for snoring. 
Uh, oh, she did not. <laughs> That's John Wesley Harden. I, I, it's not I, even spelled the same way. Well, yes, it is. But <laughs> <laughs> I told you there wasn't. Uh, Lord, wasn't, they're not related, are they? I don't know. She is mean. That's what I've heard. Mean, mean, mean. I totally <laughs> you have <know>. not. <laughs> it's apparently really nice. She does have the look and feel of hand-tooled saddle leather. <laughs> God, I, you were I'm, horrible this week. I'm being horrible because she actually is a great actor. Really are. So yeah, uh, she's terrific. Do you know any uh, any trivia about this film? No, I, I do have to say, Marsha Gay Harden does a really good Brooklyn accent from someone from La Jolla, California, <laughs> or is well, it La Jolla? It is in fact La Jolla. Well, I don't know. It's spelled La Jolla. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't bring your foreign pronunciations over here. You California. weirdo Californians. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, we'll be insulting more groups later on. But uh, for now, let's. Hey, do... you got Hey, you guys from from North Dakota. You know what I think of you? <laughs> and there they are caring. OK. Yeah. Uh, now we have the plot. Both of them. It's the early 1940s and Jackson Pollock, played by Ed Harris, lives with one of his five brothers in New York City. He's a drunk. It is getting to be too much for Pollock's sister-in-law to handle. She wants him out. 4F, because of his neurotic tendencies, oh, we'll be talking about that, he's more or less free to paint. Out of nowhere, Lee Krasner, played by Marsha Gay Harden, so mean, I know, no, no, played by Marsha Gay Harden, herself an accomplished abstract painter, seeks Pollock out to see his studio and his work. Impressed, she invites him over to her studio. Eventually showing up, he too is impressed. After some coffee and exceedingly awkward sex, they become a couple. Jackson's brother Sandy, worried he might be drafted, takes a job working for the war effort in Connecticut. His leaving throws Jackson over the edge. Going on a drinking binge, he wakes up somewhere less than wonderful and is left in the care of his girlfriend, Lee. Trying to break into the New York art world, largely through Krasner's efforts and dedication, he eventually earns the notice of arts patron Peggy Googie Goog 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 Guggenheim. <laughs> Yes, crazy Guggenheim. Yeah, uh, and I didn't write this in, but as played by Ed Harris's wife, uh, Amy Madigan. Uh, she ends up giving him not only his first solo show at her Art of the 20th ga Century Gallery, she pays him a stipend, gives him a commission to paint a huge mural for her... Mural? Mural! <sighs> Today, this week. She was painting Merle Haggard for That's him. right. Uh, he gives... Uh, let's start again, shall we? There will be a huge <laughs> edit that no one will know about. So she ends up giving him not only his first solo show at her Art of the 20th Century Gallery, she pays him a stipend, gives him a commission to paint a huge mural for her apartment, and the confidence to start breaking open his own art. Eventually, it's obvious that the city and booze are tearing Pollock apart. If he's going to make it at all, he needs to get out. Krasner decides that they're going to leave for Long Island and that if he wants her to stay, he has to marry her. He agrees. They move to a small house, and Jackson starts the mo most prolific and successful arc of his career. In his new home and away from booze, he finds a new language of abstract work using orchestrated drips and splatters that earns not only a full-color spread in Life magazine, but sold-out shows as well. Unable to deal with success, not getting the acceptance he actually needs, and pushed into doing a film of his working that he doesn't want to do, Pollock goes off the wagon and begins his downward spiral. Lee leaves for a trip to Europe. Pollock invites his mistress to the house and, in a tragic evening, drives his car off the road while drunk, killing himself and his mistress' friend. The end. The lowdown. Yeah. That That's covers it. Not entirely unlike Jim Morris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drunk, I'm known, I'm drunk, I'm famous, I'm drunk, I'm dead. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So the usual question. It's kind of surprising. Oh, go yep. go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. It, it, it's kind of surprising who shows up in this movie. I mean, at one point, there's, oh, good Lord, there's Val Kilmer as Willem, Willem, de, Willem Kooning. de Kooning. Yep. I don't know who that is. Who no. is Willem de Kooning? Willem de Kooning was a, also a very famous abstract expressionist and was in the same circle that, um, oh, all that right. Pollock was. And uh, strangely, Willem de Kooning was... Not much less of a drunk than, than Jackson Pollock was, but he last, I think he died when he was 90. He was still painting, oh, I think, wow. into, the, into the 80s, something like that. Um, and he, too, eventually moved out to Long Island and so on and so forth. Um, he 
is very well, I mean, in the fine art circle, he is also very well. But if you blink, you will miss Val Kilmer because his part is very mm. small. He's um, in like two scenes, but uh, Jeffrey Tambor is in there as yep. an art, a famous, apparently a famous art critic. That's Clement you Greenberg. Said, yep. Yep. As you said, Bud Court. Yep. Harold, all grown up and being an art critic, I guess. You know, sometimes you can sort of look at somebody and you can guess a little bit what they're going to look like when they get older. Bud Court is not one of those people. No, it's like he turned into a whole different person. And sadly, Amy Madigan, a distant... Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, sadly, he has a, a very small part. Howard uh, actually dies in the film, although off camera. Um, and Bud Court was really good in Harold and Maude. But of course, he was also like 20 back then or something. I don't know. So, yeah, sorry, I don't think he, he, he never hit anything quite as big as that. But uh, uh, Amy Madigan, in, a diff- in addition to being Ed Harris's wife, was is a pretty serious actor in her, act- in her own right. Oh, yeah. She's been in a ton of stuff. Yeah. She was really good in this. I mean, Peggy Goo Peggy Mugu Gugu is uh, not a huge <laughs> role, <laughs> but uh, she plays it very well. And it's just like, I did not, I do not climb five flights of stairs for nobody home. I have weak ankles. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It was actually nice to see her without that fright wig. Cause sadly, Peggy Guggenheim did have kind of large hair and Amy Madigan <laughs> doesn't. Um, yeah, I watched a little making of afterwards, and I got to see what she looked like without of uh, without that. Um, one of the things that they they kind of leave out is that one of Pollock's brothers, uh, Charles, was a painter. Uh, he does show up briefly uh, visiting them in the Long Island. Uh, I think it's Springs, Long Island, uh, home. Oh, okay. And he briefly mentions that he's painting and that he's painting other under a different name. And the only thing Jackson can offer back is. Why would you do that? <laughs> Charles just looks sort of crestfallen. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, I'll just stop talking. Um, sadly, Charles would continue to paint. He also lived into his 80s. He actually taught art, I believe, at the University of Michigan or Michigan State. I can't remember which one. Um, and, you know, went through the whole abstract expressionist thing, too. Some of the paintings in the apartment, which is actually his brother Sandy's apartment in the beginning, might hmm. be Jackson's, they might actually be Charles's. They both studied under the same oh, guy, okay. so it's hard to tell. Hmm. Uh, but I was going to ask the usual question. I think you kind of answered it earlier. Uh, did you see yeah. this when it came out? I saw this before it came out. Oh. I Yeah. I was a member of uh, a Sunday cinema club, and they would sh- we would see movies that were either independent or foreign films before they went into wide release. Oh, is this that club? Yeah. The roll yes, the dice, was, you might get some, you know, Eastern European children dying for the next two hours kind of club. That was one one particularly bad year. There was like every other movie involved children dying horribly. That was a depressing series. But that was also how I got to see Bend It Like Beckham before it came out and The Station Agent and a bunch of stuff. And yeah, they showed Pollock. Mm-hmm. And mainly the thing was most of the movies that we saw were starring people I'd never heard of. Oh. So I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, it's Major Glenn, you know, or Colonel Glenn, you know, oh. from, you know, Ed Harris from The Right Stuff, and there's Marsha Gay Harden, I knew who she was, and all these other people. At that, and, and hey, it's the guy from uh, Top Secret, <laughs> you know, Val Kilmer, so yeah. I didn't really know him. So, yeah, I did. What about you? Did you see when it came out? I think so. I honestly don't remember. I believe so, and I think that the thing was is that I was, um, you know, this is giving something away. I was so enamored with the film that I bought the DVD the second it was available because I remember uh-huh. seeing it multiple times roughly when it would when it would have come out. So I think so. Um, and Ed Harris, to me, the reason I knew Ed Harris was from The Abyss. And oh, I don't, sure. I know he had done work before then, but I when I saw The Abyss, I didn't know who the heck he was. But it's like, who's this guy? He's this great everyman character. I really liked him in The Abyss. It's like, I, I want to know this guy. Um, I don't know if I actually want to know Ed Harris because he he's a method actor, which says, given apparently he was very serious on set. He does not. Uh, there's probably not a lot of goofy fun outtakes and stuff. Yeah, um, method actors tend to be really talent, really good, but they tend to be a lot. Yeah, but I do like him. Uh, I saw he had a great performance in a movie that most people can't stand called The Hours. Uh, which starred uh, oh boy, oh dear gods, what is her name for uh, Nicole Kidman? And yep, yep. Uh, Julianne Moore is in That's it. Right. Uh, Who? Uh, Tony Collette. Great acting. 
really good acting. Oh, yeah. Not a happy movie. <laughs> No, not a happy movie. Again, as you say, it is an actor's movie. It's a you yeah. know, amazing performances all around, but it's one of those where it's like, ah, putting rocks in your in your clothing and walking into the river. That sounds like a great idea now that I have seen this movie. Find me a river. Yeah. Who is afraid of Virginia Woolf? That's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, apparently the Thames. Uh, <laughs> so the acting in this film... Uh, Jeffrey Tambor is an interesting actor in here because Jeffrey Tambor seems perfectly at home doing drama and comedy because he was yeah. on, was it um, the Gary the Larry Sanders show? Larry, show. Yep. The Larry Sanders show, yes, yeah. and as, as Hank Kingsley, and he plays this goofy jerk, and he's wonderful, but he's also uh, does a great job in Transparent mm-hmm. as, as a... Uh, uh, a man transitioning to being a woman, and he's he often plays bad guys. He plays, you know, lovable klutzes. He's got real range. Yeah, and he does great. Now, to be fair, I don't know anything about Clement and Greenberg, the real person. I, they're both bald, but that otherwise seemed to be the only, <laughs> like, the things they had in common. I don't know. I don't know how he mm. sounds, but he comes off as very erudite, very sure of himself, and his opinions... Art, he, that's what he does is he writes about art. And quite honestly, he was the, one of the, I went and did some research. He was one of the biggest literary champions of the abstract expressionists. And there was a big shift because up till this point, art was still centered in Paris. Um, and all of the big art names had come from Europe and were doing their biggest work in Paris. Of course, Picasso was far from done. Um, he was in, in the 40s. He was still very much a big thing. And everyone compares themselves to... to um, I literally forgot the name of the guy I just said. Uh, Picasso. Picasso. Yeah. Uh, hello? I, I mean, hello? Are we, are, are we supposed to... Is that just... We're supposed to know that? That's why uh, Pollock hates Picasso so much? I mean... The first time we ever run into the character, he's drunk, his brother's trying to carry him upstairs, and he's screaming, F. Picasso, F. Picasso, at the top of his lungs. Um, I would say that this is a movie that's really not giving you any kind of primer um, in some ways. So if you're if you're interested in the factual doings of the art world of New York in the 40s, which are actually pretty fascinating, they're not going to tell you any of that. So... In some ways, yeah, you're supposed to know. But to be fair, if people know one artist, one fine artist, there's one of two names they're probably going to know. It's going to be Picasso or it's going to be Rembrandt. So, um, but yeah, Jeffrey Tambor, he's great. He's not there much, but he is this absolute stone in the quickly running brook that is Jackson Pollock. He sits there and goes, paint is paint. I, you're trying to, he's basically telling Pollock, you're trying to do too much. Just, I can't tell you why it's wrong, but it's not right. And then later he's like, yeah, you've got it. And it made a difference. That's probably why a lot of people went to see his paintings when initially they didn't. This is some of the stuff he says. I don't understand. He's like, oh, what is it? Uh, it's gorgeous, Pollock, but gorgeous isn't enough. Well, so. Oh, there's, okay. Okay. I'm a, I'm a fine arts nerd. So this kind of stuff yeah. I get. Um, and I didn't when I, before I saw this film, but. Being pretty isn't enough, is what he's saying. There needs to be something in it. There has to be something that actually grabs uh, the person's attention and holds it longer than the second that, oh, that's nice, and you move on. So if you want to be a serious artist, if you want to be taken seriously, if you want to make the big money, there has to be more to it than just pretty. Um, I mean, there were some of those, like when, uh, at one point, when Pollock is starting to do his drip painting, mm-hmm. you know, the, the thing he would... Sh- as someone who is not a fine arts nerd or a, or even a fine arts appreciator, really, I mean, I, I you know I, I like me a nice picture of dogs playing poker, you know the <laughs> classics. But <laughs> of course you do. The thing I know Jackson Pollock for, I actually didn't know he did before I saw the movie. I didn't know he did anything else. Were those famous paintings where basically he puts the canvas on the floor and drips paint on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he's doing that, at one point Lee Krasner comes in, looks at it, and goes. You've done it, Pollock. You've cracked it wide open. And I, I have this in my notes. Huh? What has he cracked? Huh? What? I didn't understand that. Does that mean she, he had re- she thought he had really figured out the essence of abstract art? What he had done, and again, the film does not tell you this, 
is that he had finally moved away from anything figurative in his work. There was nothing in the paintings that was meant to represent anything. He was p basically painting from pure emotion. Um, and that might be one of the ways that the movie fails. And I actually, I'm really glad to hear your view to this because I get it, right? I'm sitting there hearing, I hear that and it's like, oh, I totally know what she's talking about. But the movie doesn't tell you. And in fact, when she says it, we're not looking at the painting. We're looking at her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But that's what the deal is, is that he was, and I will tell you as having somebody who's done some abstract work, it is really hard to paint something that doesn't look like something. Because you're sitting there painting and your brain, even subconsciously, is trying to make it look like a person or a hand or a face or something. Like it's mm -hmm. your brain doesn't want to just depict nothing or emotion or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was trying to do. And even Picasso at his height, all of his work was figurative. There just wasn't anything that wasn't meant to represent a specific thing. He might be trying to represent it in a different way, uh, such as cubism, etc. But Picasso never really did pure abstraction. And that's what the abstract expressionists were all about. They were all about um, trying to depict things, not necessarily in a um, figurative way. Some of them did. De Kooning did. He actually did a lot of female nudes, although you have to be told that that's what they are because you wouldn't know <laughs> otherwise. Um, <sighs> but yeah, that's, that's what he had managed to do. Um, one of the cool things is that when you see Ed Harris painting, Ed Harris is painting. Oh, okay. And it is the only movie I've ever seen about a painter where I actually believe that the person is painting. Um, there was a film that came out not long after this about Frida Kahlo, and it starred... Uh, uh, Selma Hayek. Thank you. And I think Selma Hayek did a great job as uh, Frida Kahlo, but I didn't believe for an instant she was painting. Like, there was just no uh. feeling that she was painting. And they did some really cool stuff. So that big mural, there's one point where he has to paint this mural for Peggy Guggenheim. It is 8 by 30 feet. Yeah. Um, Originally, he was supposed to paint it on the wall yep. of her apartment, but yep. he did it on a canvas so it'd be portable. Yeah, somebody convinced him. It was somebody famous. I can't remember who it was, but somebody said, don't do yeah. that. Put it on canvas. And the legend is that he painted it in one night. That may or may not be true, but that's how it's best known. So that's why they depict it the way they did. Um, well, what is it she was complaining? He had just been staring at it for three weeks. Right. Trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. And he finally just, I mean, to be fair... You've heard the bit about the author being afraid of the blank page or the artist afraid yeah. of the blank page. That's pretty big blank to be afraid of because it's like eight That's by a lot feet. to be faced with, yeah. yeah. So what they did was they got scene painters, you know, uh, like um, flats for, for stage. They got scene painters and they basically recreated the painting in reverse. So they first yeah. they, they have a nice big blank canvas and they said, Ed, just go to town, just paint. So Ed would paint. Then they would do another canvas that was further along, but still looked like it was going to become the final mural. And they said, okay, Ed, now paint on this. And there were like three or four steps of this until finally they had a recreated version of the painting. But every time Harris is there slapping paint on. And he apparently, there's one film of, which they, they show in the movie, there's one film of, of Pollock actually painting. So he got an idea of what it was about and got really into it and stuff. But... Yeah, so there's paint everywhere in that film, and it's all Ed Harris throwing it around. I mean, I gotta say, Ed Harris's performance in this is remarkable to the point where, a lot of the time, it's really uncomfortable to watch. Yes, I mean, this is not a this is not an easy movie. No, they don't make it as bad as it could. I remember reading a review saying I thought this was just going to be a spraying spittle movie. That was just going to be. Uh, uh, Krasner and Pollock screaming at each other for two hours. <laughs> which, which it really could have been, because apparently that happened. Yeah. But it, it isn't. There's enough of it. And it's also a really painful uh, portrait, as it were, of someone dealing with mental illness, because he was. There was something There was something broke there. There was something seriously wrong that was not treated in any way, and that was exacerbated by his massive alcoholism. Yeah. Uh, I, he was clearly either manic. He was either bipolar or or depressive or who knows. Yeah, nineteen forty one. What did they know? Nothing. Um, yeah, my note was Ed Harris is both great and hard to watch. Uh, yeah. There are two. 
ostensibly two sex scenes that we don't actually see anything mm-hmm. even though we don't see anything really both of them are awkward as hell <laughs> yeah yeah the first one with lee krasner is just like uh, he honestly looks like he has no idea what's about to happen and the second one is with mugu gugu and it honestly <laughs> it's just yeah it's just awkward and not good and then there's later there's a scene where he's like i want to have a baby and thankfully lee krasner's like yeah. no no, absolutely yeah. not. You're watching this, you're going, that is the worst idea any human has ever had. You, should, Oh my God, this guy shouldn't shouldn't have been, I was amazed he had a dog. <laughs> he shouldn't have been trusted with a dog. God, a human child, that would be, a, it would have been a nightmare. Yeah. What the hell was with the crow? He, For some reason they sort of adopt a crow. He did. He apparently, that's actually real. He befriended and oh, wow. they had a crow as the pet. The dog too was just there. Like it wasn't there. They, it just showed up and they were, it was his pet. And I'd forgotten about the crow, but yeah, Corky the crow. No, it wasn't Corky. <laughs> um, I, and just the appeal he has in some ways is so baffling in this movie because people are just drawn to him and especially women seem to be nuts for him. I mean, good heavens, he ends up with Jennifer Connelly. Yeah. I mean, Edith, whatever her name is. It was Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> Um, shall we say that Jennifer Connelly was her portrayal and her looks were a bit fantasized, shall we say? Um, but have you seen pictures of Edith? What's her name? Yeah. Ah, okay. You know, a very nice person, probably, you know, a nice looking woman, but no, no. Didn't look like Jennifer Connelly. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, and here's, uh, so I don't understand why Edith was attracted to him once she got to know him. Yeah. But, yeah. What, why would anyone, basically, why would anyone go on a second date with him? But here's the thing. Power, um, popularity, celebrity, all of those things attract attention. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. And the sad thing is, of course, you see a, a very, very subtle but good example of this. So he has this show with Mugu Gugu. I'm sorry, Peggy Guggenheim. <laughs> ah, yeah, Peggy Guggenheim. Yeah. I know that's crazy Guggenheim. It's cookie Guggenheim. Crazy Guggenheim. Yep. Um, at this, at her gallery, the Art of the 20th Century, where uh, where she made a lot of stars herself. She had that gallery, and she was well known, well known patron of the arts. And that show, nothing sold. Nobody was interested. To be fair, oh, wow. he does change his style, but it's because of people like Clement Greenberg who write about it. And now everyone's like, oh, well, you know, this Pollock guy, isn't he just the best thing? Oh, you, I got to have to give me one of those paintings. Um, because it, partially it's what people are told that they like, even if they don't know if they like it. But yeah. he's he's it's his show. It's this big gallery. I can't remember if it was the MoMA or what it was. Uh, where he had his gallery, but it was a big deal. So of course people, you know, they think they want to be close to Jackson Pollock, but, and the film starts with him looking utterly lost and somebody comes up and hands him the life magazine to get him to sign it. And it's just like, uh, sure. And he's, he doesn't know what to do. And the cool thing is the film cycles back to that moment. Cause it, they show yeah. us how we got there. The cooler yeah, thing is he... we don't stop there. That's like, okay, this is the fame. This is the basically. This is the height. Now what? And the film answers that question. Sadly, that's such a painful shot. He's at the Betty Parsons Gallery. That's what it was. And Betty he's signing. He's he's signing something, and he just looks across the room at at Marcia Gay Hart, you know, Lee Krasner, and the look he gives her is so broken and so tr- sad. It's like I don't know what to do. I don't know why I'm here. I don't understand this. Yeah. And she looks back and she gets it. And this is, again, was such an amazing job that she did because she looks at him and just you can just see, oh, God, I can't fix this. I can't make this better. I can take care of him to a degree, but I can't make it better. And I think, well, and Marcia Gay Harden does an amazing job. I had not heard of her before this. Boy, did she oh, deserve she's been that around Academy forever. Mm. She deserved it. She was really, really good. And I, there's a making of documentary on the disc, which I own. And there's a great scene where we actually see Ed Harris directing her. And they were talking about this. She said, Ed was a great director because in the middle of a scene, he would direct you and then just have you start over. Like, no, we're not stopping the cameras. We're just going for it. And one of her lines is when um, Pollock says, I want to have a kid and they're having an argument. And her final word on it is, 
I am not bringing a child into that. And I, <sighs> you get to see her do it. And then Ed Harris is like, no, do it again. And it's very gruff and very demanding, but you can tell this is an actor's director. This is a director who gets it and will give you, and some of them said that he gave us what we needed to get to, to the best. So demanding, but yeah, that's partially why that performance came out. And you see the alternate take and it's like, okay, there's a huge difference. Um, but she's great. Um, and Krasner, I don't know if she actually nails Krasner so much, but because I've seen some interviews with her later on, and to be fair, she was much older. Um, but Krasner is both not taking any crap and is also the person who can see the genius in him the best. And what's really <clears throat> killing her is what it takes to actually get it out. Because later in the film, he she's just like, just paint, 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 paint. You know, it's like, I don't <clears throat> care what else you do. She's even sort of waving her hand at the the liaison that she knows he's having. <sighs> just mm-hmm. for him to do what he's meant to do. And she can't even get him to do that. It's just so, it's such a strange relationship that what she is, seems to be in love with is his talent. Mm-hmm. And what, what she, she'll put up with anything else as long as he paints, as long as she can, as long as he creates, mm-hmm. even though it's overshadowing her, it's over, it's overshadowing her work. She Maybe just thinks he's that amazing. Yeah. And in a way, he was. He's one of those people, one of those artists specifically, who unfortunately you can't take out of their time because the impact that their work had is tied directly to when they made it. Because if we look at it now, it's like, yeah, big deal. And how many times have you heard, my kid can do that? Hey, guess what? No, they can't. Yeah, that that is something I wanted to bring up. I wanted to cover. That is what you hear a lot about Pollock these days. People... And you heard about it, I think, even when he was painting. Oh, yeah. People just looked at it, and it's like, this isn't paint. This isn't art. This is somebody's drop cloth. This is what was on the floor when he was spilling paint. It's just smears of paint and then uh, strands of paint. It doesn't look like anything. It looks like it was an accident. You, you know, all this stuff you hear about him. That was one of the things I liked about this movie is you you see he's not randomly throwing paint Every line, every drop, he he knows what he's doing. It's intentional. Very. But it's very hard to grasp. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard. Uh, abstract art usually just leaves me in the dust. I don't understand it. I don't get it. Yeah. And I, I, I've understood that criticism. People say, my kid could do this. Because on the surface, it looks like anybody could do that. But it turns out not to be because... He, I just don't know why. Well, part of the problem with abstract art is that the more abstract you get, the less you're actually giving the audience to grab a hold of, right? So if you look at even something like by, oh, some of the post-impressionists like Van Gogh or um, not Gauguin, the other one, I can't think of his name, uh, the father of us all, I should know, the grandfather of us all, as, as uh, Picasso put it, I can't think of his name, he was French, whatever. Matisse? You look at it, huh? No, not Matisse. Matisse. He's in this. He's he's a Fovis. He mother. too. He was French. Yes. Yes. He was. Yeah. <laughs> Are all artists French? I win. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> but if you look at like a still life done by that person, you can still yeah. tell it's an apple. It's a banana. You know, it's whatever. Yeah. When we get to the abstract expressionists, they're basically not giving you anything. There is a quote in the film, and it's I don't think it's an actual Pollock quote. I think it's close, that I really like. And that quote is, if people would just leave most of their stuff at home and look at the painting. And the thing about Pollock's work, and not I don't like all of his work. Some of it, I think, is better than others. But there is a rhythm to it. There's a, a musicality to it. There is a... There is definitely a feeling to it. Now, the cool thing is, is that you can bring whatever feeling you want to that. The hard part is if you're unable to do that because it's not an easy thing to do. And quite honestly, it often takes some work and some uh, research. You're not going to get it. It's not for everybody. And is that good or bad? Some people say, well, that shows it's real high art because you're it shouldn't just be for the masses. And other people rightfully say, if I can't see anything in it, what use does it have? Um, But you're right. The best part is that it shows this was not random at all. 
he's orchestrating that paint. It's going where he wants it to go. He's using colors he wants to use. There is purpose to it. And I didn't get it either. Before I saw this film, I was like, yeah, Pollock, whatever. You know, oh, look, I spit. It's art. Um, and there are people who do that. So, uh. mm-hmm. but, you know, there's Ed Harris doing his best and he does great recreating what Pollock did to make paintings. And I got to tell you again, it's hard to make something that doesn't look like something. It's really hard because if you do it for any length of time, suddenly there's a face, suddenly there's a figure, suddenly there's something. That's how your brain works. It's, it wants to make sense out of randomness and to keep going and still make something that's both attractive and non-figurative is not easy. So, hmm. but that's the big deal with that. Um, one of the one of the things in the story that surprised me a little. This is out of left field. It's fine. You know, they're living in this little Long Island town, and I get the feeling nobody knows who he is there. Nope. But at one point, he pays off his grocery bill with a painting. Mm. I'm like, really? Would the guy have taken this this strange spattered painting in exchange for what was it like three hundred dollars worth of groceries? It wasn't even that. I think it was fifty bucks. Mm. I got to tell you, if the guy and, held on to it, he would have been a lot oh, yeah. better off. <laughs> he probably could have bought the whole town. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have already gone on and on about this because I'm an art nerd and a lot of this stuff excites me. But we should probably get to our little questions. Not saying that we're bringing a halt to the entire discussion, but we have yeah. our little our little questions. Oh, uh, I, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what do we know about Pollock from this movie? Oh, uh, that's actually a little tricky. We see a lot of what he does. We don't know a lot of the inner stuff. We don't know what made him the way he is. We don't know why he's the way he is. We don't know a lot of his inner life, except the term that he's in a lot of pain, a lot of turmoil. Mm-hmm. We don't know what drives him. But I don't know if we're supposed to or if we'd even want to. It's always the thing about any kind of artist. It's the same with the musicians or the, the writers. I think, I, I mean, I knew nothing. I The first time I saw this, I went into this knowing, oh yeah, the spatter guy. Mm-hmm. That was it. I didn't, even, I didn't even know what era he painted in. But, so you learn, I, you learn a fair amount. You learn his, some of his history, even though what the movie only covers, like what, seven years? No, no, it starts in 1941. Oh, and right, 41, 56. So yeah, it's 15 years out of his life, which admittedly is about a third of his life, because he was, what, 44 when he died? Mm, something like 44, 45, something like that. He was in his, he was in his 40s. He was comparatively young. But by the way, at the, when, at the end, he's, was it just me or is the fact that he's got his, that crazy long beard and the striped shirt make him look a little like Picasso? Only a lot. <laughs> yeah. Although Picasso that didn't could have been an accident. Have yeah. Yeah, uh, but that he was famous for that blue and white striped shirt. Uh, I think we mostly learn emotionally about Pollock yeah. as to what drove him. It's the need to create art. I mean, that's just, I don't even know if you can depict that other than what it is. It's like, I have to do this. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, I certainly get that part. Um, and you do too. Cause you have to podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is my life. <laughs> You're stuck with me. Ha ha. Ha ha. <laughs> Uh, how accurate was the depiction? Uh, I don't know. Um, I read a little bit about it, and apparently, at least in terms of the tone, it was very accurate. That's kind of what pe- how people saw him. I don't know if all the events are accurate. I know the, the stuff with the, the Guggenheim uh, uh, mural, that was accurate. I don't know. That's something you would know better, was it? How accurate is this movie? Um, actually, it seems to be pretty accurate. There was two inaccuracies I could find. Um, one of them was that Pollock was actually very successful after the Life magazine article, but then moved into a black and white period, which was not successful. Uh, oh. He went back to more colorful works and moved away from the drip paintings. That was not the last of his things. He went back oh. to his more figurative but still abstract um, style and sold a lot of paintings. The problem was suddenly it became a huge demand and people wanted him to keep creating more of the same thing. So the pressure from that and his frustration with having to basically paint what people wanted to keep being popular and never really getting, I think the actual acceptance that he really wanted uh, with his alcoholism was what really was a perfect storm. 
basically. Um, and we don't really see, we, we hear Clement Greenberg talking about how he had a good 10 year run and it's over. And it turns out that part wasn't true. Uh, the other part was that, and this I thought was really interesting. It's actually thought that Krasner was the one who schooled him in the ideas of modern painting as she was more educated than he was. So, huh. and even after his death until her own death, she oversaw the estate and his work and how it was exhibited and all that stuff. So she continued to paint well into the 1980s. Um, and her work continued to go, but a lot of people were like, you know, that non-figurative stuff, that actually may have been her pushing him in a direction and not his original idea. Um, Whoa. Which, but of course, her being a woman, it being the 1940s, naturally everybody wanted to stamp that and shove it to the side because... Even in the art world? Yeah. Oh, oh. We, remember what he says when he first goes to her studio? You're a good oh, woman yeah. painter. That's right, yeah. Because, I mean, that's still today. Women in any field are still treated like crap because stupid. Yeah. Um, and she has quite a body of work. She kept going. I mean, let's put it this way. She survived Jackson Bollock and yeah. kept painting. That's no mean feat. So That's yeah. impressive. Um, do we feel we get to know the subject better after, after having watched this? Oh, I did because I knew nothing about him before. And again, it, on an emotional level, like you say, yeah, I you get more of a connection. You get more of an idea at least of, of what he was. Mm. What do you think? I came into this film almost exactly as you did. Oh, he's the splatter guy. And I, I didn't actually like most abstract work until I saw this film. And then I got it. I suddenly understood it because I could see. I think part of the problem is sometimes people are worried that they're being made a fool of, right? Campbell's suit cans. Mm. Oh, you put that up because you want to see how much money you can get from the, the intelligentsia. Honestly, I don't know that that wasn't part of what Warhol was doing. Uh, <laughs> and that's a problem. It's like if you feel like you're being made a fool of, you're not willing to bring any of yourself to the work you're trying to make sense of. Because it's like, well, I'm not going to take this seriously. They all look stupid. Um, and so I didn't get it. And I saw this. And because of the amount of research and the amount of himself that Ed Harris put into this, I think we get to know a lot about him. I don't think he's a person I would want to have known as fascinating mm. as his work was, but you know, they don't shy away from his personality at all. Um, he just treats people around him. like crap. It's like it's the one person so un- he's seen, even his brother whom he adores, Sandy. Mm. He's just, yeah. Sadie always has to drag him home and stuff. Um, yeah. I, you know, honestly, I think it's safe to say without Lou Krasner, there wouldn't have been a Jackson Pollock as far as we, as the art world's concerned. So even he says that at one point, he says, I owe that woman. I would be dead without her. And I, when he says that, I go, yeah, you would. <laughs> yeah. I, that was in my notes. Quote, I owe the woman something end quote. And I said, Oh, or really everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, sadly we won't have Ralph Nader for another, I think nine years. Cause <laughs> there's no seatbelts in 1956. <laughs> Uh, which is yeah. part of the problem. Also the problem that that car probably going at some ridiculous speed weighed, Oh, I don't know, three or four tons. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other notes or things you wanted to get to before we, uh, wrap I, her up? Well, I do, do want to point out the ending of this movie and sorry, spoiler alert, you know, when he dies in the car crash, yeah. not really a spoiler. If you know anything about Pollock, I knew that even before I saw the movie, but, uh, because it was mentioned in a cartoon, uh, <laughs> The, it ends very abruptly. Yeah. I mean, literally, it ends with the car crash. Screen goes black. We see, like, you know, Jackson Pollock and uh, uh, whatever Edith's friend, friend's yeah. name was. Yeah. Uh, the friend died in the crash, and Edith survived. And that's it. It's over. It's very jarring. I, I assume that, I mean, I try. I get, I think, what he's trying to do in that, in that he's trying to... Uh, point out just the suddenness and pointlessness of the end of Jackson Pollock's life and the end of Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. But it's hard. It's makes that movie a lot harder to watch. Yeah. That was pretty much it. Yeah. They don't, as I said, they don't really shy away from anything here. Uh, And who knows, maybe there was, I've never heard anything about him being actually physically abusive, but they probably left out some of the drunken arguments, (laughs) Mm. which is fine because we get plenty. Mm. Yep. So, well, let's get to the uh, yeah. the wrapping up or the rounding up thereof. The roundup. So, Max, yeah. I know you saw it in your film club, in your depressing, this European children die <laughs> film club. 
do you remember what you thought about it at the time? I remember thinking these were some amazing performances, and I never wanted to see this movie again. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. What did you think about it after the second time you saw it for the show? Pretty very similar. I think this is a uh, this is really an actor's movie. I think the performance is a terrific. Uh, I think it does end very abruptly. There's so much more that it's kind of frustrating because I wish I knew more. I wish I'd gotten a little bit more of his inner life, of what what was driving him, what made him like that. I wish I had seen more of the art scene itself. The bits and pieces we see are really interesting. I like, like who, who was who is this artist Val Kilmer? Or, you know, Willem <laughs> D- um, Willem de Kooning. He's Batman. Oh, <laughs> you know, who are these other people? Who, you know, Peggy Guggenheim, you're just supposed to know who, Pe- now, admittedly, I knew who Peggy Guggenheim was, you know, because I was, I live in the Northeast and I'm alive. You might have but, heard of her uh, grandfather. He uh, yeah. made this building, you know. Yeah, the upside down cake box. Very yeah. weird. Um, <laughs> well, to be fair, he didn't design it. That was yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright, but whatever. That explains a lot. I, I don't like that museum, but anyway. A lot of people don't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you try to hang paintings on round walls. <laughs> Paintings. I would have loved to see paintings. You know the stuff they have there? Anyway, mm. you know, broken television sets upside down in urinals with uh, uh, That's old, huffy, hu- old huffy bike tires t- attached to them. And, yeah. Uh, again, I think this is really well done. I admit there's a lot I just don't get. I am not an art guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not a painting guy. I A lot of it... Uh, is over my head and I don't get, but uh, I thought the performances were terrific. But again, this is so hard to watch because they don't shy away. They show you he was incredibly hard to be around. What about you? I mean, I obviously, I think you've kind of given it away how important this movie was to you. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, it, it came at a point for me that I was just trying to start to explore fine art. I was finally ready for it. There's actually one point where I watched the DVD. I was watching the DVD. I was finishing up a painting. I can't remember what it was, but I was finishing up and I was still like, the movie just got me into this groove. And I did an abstract painting right in about 20 minutes right after that. That remains one of my favorite paintings that I've ever done. It's actually hanging on the wall behind me. You can't see it because I have a little zoom back up. Um, (laughs) And I was suddenly interested in the way that you wish you were when you were in college. I was interested in fine art. Um, I think it's easier for me because I do know who a lot of these people were, or I was interested enough to go and look them up because I didn't know who they were. Um, I've done things like read a big, thick Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Willem de Kooning. So I know that whole thing. Um, Mm. And it's actually really good to hear your critique because I think they're totally valid. I think that if you're coming at this totally cold and you don't know anything about the New York art world in the 1940s, you're probably going to be like, ah, who's the guy with the mustache? (laughs) The glasses. I don't know. Um, Third base, by the way. So I get it. But I think that what the film, I think actually Ed does a great job directing too, because the film does flow very well. Yeah. It has an abrupt ending. So did Pollock. And I think that again is the point. Yeah. Um, We could want to see more about Lee Krasner, but that's not who the film was about. Um, And quite honestly, I think it would have done her disservice because if we'd seen more of her after that, we'd all be like, well, wait, what about all the stuff during this time? And what about before she there wouldn't have been enough of her? Um, Yeah, you could do a film about her. I think she should get her own movie. Yeah, Um, I I love this film, but I know it's flawed. Just, you know, again, from having talked to you about it, the performances are great. There's not a weak performance in here, even you know, Val Kilmer's three lines are not badly done at all. Um, Mm -hmm. Bud court for five seconds, stuff like that. Um, It's got one of the best fake snow scenes I've ever seen because of the snow outside (laughs) fake. I would not have guessed. Um, So I really like this film. If you're not a fine arts person, if you're not into learning anything about Jackson Pollock, go ahead and skip it. But I think it's, if you have any interest in it, I mean, if you're just even a little curious about it, I think it's a decent intro. As I say, it it throws you in the deep end, but you take some stuff out of it. Yeah. And also, I just love watching people paint. That's a huge thing. 
So uh, let's go back over this week's poll question um, yeah, before yeah. we we have to we have to wrap up this series. But uh, this week's yes, poll we question again: Is there a movie that you're really glad you saw in a theater, or you wish you had seen there because you think it would lose impact by being seen on the small screen? Uh, you can let us know through various ways. One of them is our email address. You could use that. It's dusty and lonely, but you could use it. It's us at maxmikemovies.com. Speaking of yep. maxmikemovies.com, we have a website at that very same address where you can leave comments do. where some of you do. Thank you very much. Yep. All, all of our episodes are there, so you can go back through the other 17 series. Whew, we have <laughs> episodes. Uh, and listen to them at your leisure again and again and again. Or you could just stab yourself in the uh, eye with a fork, either way. Um, That's fun, too. It is fun. You could find us on social media like Twitter or Facebook under Max Mike Movies. And if you've probably already know that, but pretty much every uh, major podcast app out there has got us, including some we probably don't even know about. Yep. But that brings uh, the current version, at least, of uh, Semi Real People, the biopic story, to a close. Uh, I had a couple extra mm. episodes in here. So we're going to go somewhere next, Max. Max. Yeah. How, where are you taking us on your flight of fancy, your wings of desire, your winds of remembrance? <laughs> okay, you've gotten at the cooking sherry again, haven't you? It's not it's not sherry. It's I can't read it. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, we are starting a new series next week. This one is, um, I think it's an interesting one. I think it's an important thing to do, but I think it's going to be incredibly uncomfortable. Oh, good. This series we're calling Whitewashing. This is famous movies, or at least well-known movies, where they had white actors playing non-white parts. I don't see the problem, Max. What are you talking yeah. about, blink, blink? <laughs> you know, we're talking like Chuck Connors with his big blue eyes playing Geronimo. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, Not we're not doing that one in particular because... I don't think we could. I don't think we could watch that. But there are movies, some of which are acclaimed, some of which are not. That well, uh, for, luckily they're not doing this anymore. So these are all in the past, the distant, distant past. Right, uh, Max? Right. <laughs> uh, we got to talk after the broadcast. Um, uh -oh. But we're going to start off with this is a particularly uncomfortable movie. I haven't watched this in a long time, but I really like this movie. Despite the real problem that is essential to the story, it's the movie called A Majority of One. Oh. And yeah, this is uh, Rosalind Russell and Alec Guinness. Oh, well, what's the heck that? of a cast? Rosalind Russell, a nice Irish Catholic girl, is playing Mrs. Jacoby, an old Brooklyn Jewish woman. Uh, but it's like, that, okay, it's... that's not too bad. And Alec Guinness is playing Mr. Asano, a Japanese businessman. Oh. Wait, Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yes. Oh. Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Lady Killers, the Lavender Hill Mob, is playing one of the whitest Englishmen you'll ever run into, and that's saying something, sorry, England, is playing a Japanese man. Well... If you'd like to yeah. join us as we watch Hollywood insult race after race after race, please come in next week for a majority of one. This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench. 